Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Dallas professor, John Kleisick, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. Okay, what, what else can you tell us about education as far as this project programs, the effect it's actually had on the, the local uh, education system that would otherwise be largely geared towards right, the indigenous culture? Well, more recently, um, I would say for the last uh, two to three years, uh, UNESCO's uh, regional offices, for example, we have a regional office in Asia, there's one for Latin America, Africa, and so on. They have been concentrating on uh, what they call integrating living heritage and arts into education. Uh, and this has become um, a more prominent area of uh, UNESCO's work. And uh, the, the way it has taken shape is something that uh, I am in disagreement with, because what it does is <clears throat> it sets before the education ministry it sets before the education ministry of a country a prescription of how to approach the living heritage, uh, the components of living heritage that exist in that country as seen by UNESCO. And that prescription contains those components with a very, uh, let's see, a detailed description of where these are meant to fit in to a standard curriculum at a particular grade. And once again, what is happening here is that the ability of a cohort of teachers and educators in a, a local setting are being asked to follow a prescription, which is not theirs, to bring in cultural content, which has been standardized internationally, using teaching methods, which are also international. And therefore, once this is done in some way, it will conform to the integration of living heritage into education as being localized for that country. I, this is just a very, very, uh, but it's, it's, uh, its machinery is in fact much more complicated. And uh, I think its machinery is also uh, being forced into countries, which of course they have, um, I would say ramshackle education systems because those education systems have had are trying to juggle with so many demands uh, and so many of those demands are so unreasonable because it, they, not only do you have the big 800 pound gorilla in the room which is UNICEF uh, which is dictating virtually every grade what there should be in terms of content and methods and outputs and deliverables and the reporting structures. Virtually every grade in every country where UNICEF is, is operating, UNICEF is telling the, the country ministry of education, this is how you do it. Again, the uh, implicit uh, assumption being that there is no education system there to begin with. And what there was, was not good enough for our age and our world anymore. And so you have these two agencies now, UNICEF and UNESCO, one which is reformulating the, the structure down to the, the detail of the grade and whether it's a public school or a private school and whether it's government funded or privately funded. And UNESCO, which is designing the cultural component. How do you identify that? How do you pick from its own lists in its own conventions a, for example, a kite flying festival or a doll festival or a traditional dance form, how to represent those 
which ways to to which way should they be drawn uh, at what point of the curriculum should they appear how many hours they should be devoted to uh, what to look for in the attention of the child as to whether uh, this has been absorbed or not and so we have a micromanagement to a, a unprecedented degree or an attempt to micromanage to an unprecedented degree loading teachers at primary and secondary school levels already who are bearing loads coming from other sectors especially the economic sectors which is in fact trying to push these children away from culture and into stem where they will become product productive units of a gdp uh, denominated economy so it It, the totality of it is is completely schizophrenic because at least both these exist and the uh, unicef and unesco somehow appear to expect although i don't think that is the case appear to expect that there will be a discernible cultural uh, spark uh, or well i can't call it spark a discernible cultural uh, um manifestation in the children at the end of the 10th grade uh, which then they can claim credit for uh, once again it is a a uh, i would say it's a monstrous uh, attempt to to try and and determine the daily cycle of of learning that a child must go through and should go through naturally according to his or her uh cultural context and that contextualization is being entirely taken away and replaced by this machine like approach to children in the first place this is really the the summary of what i have experienced directly for the last 2 to 3 years yeah you know in my research that's that is the the, the real justification or the real rationale for why they want the distance learning all the remote technology all the digital stuff because that can actually track whether or not like you said that micromanaged list of learning outcomes learning competencies right lessons how many hours who facilitates it, the social emotional learning part of it which i saw in one of those slides and the, the through the technology you can track all that with the data and you know if you don't have the technology then you know the the local teacher might go we're not doing that today we're you know what i mean like we'll check the boxes like they do for us when we when we set up our programs but we're going to learn right what we what we really need to learn for our, for our local community here and in in my in my research you know as you mentioned you know it's it's largely to it's to develop a global workforce that's acclimated for this fourth industrial revolution which means managing and interfacing with all of these digital technologies which is ultimately transhumanism and once you integrate the human biology with the technology with the computers the human being is no more different than the raw materials that they extract to produce all these other products for consumption and exchange so essentially what you're doing is you're you're training the human beings to to be commodities in this in this transhuman workforce and so you know you have to ultimately have to destroy those local cultures right you have to any memory of you being a human being with some kind of a, a natural or spiritual or something outside of this technocratic paradigm of you know multinational corporations ngos and governments Uh, you have to erase that otherwise right you you aren't going to you're not going to function so smoothly as one of these little robot things right um you know and the other like you said the other gasping part about it is that you know they don't just they they don't just erase the culture they they co-opt it and they and they and they turn it into something else and you know so Julian Huxley was the first director general of UNESCO right and his brother was Aldous Huxley who wrote Brave New World and you know it's all about what we're talking about now written in the 30s 
And Julian Huxley was also the guy who was the president of the British Eugenic Society, but then later he's the one who coined the term transhumanism. Well, in, in Brave New World, one of the themes is, and all this actually based this off of one of Julian's novels. Julian wrote a novel called What Dare I Think? And Julian's thing was that you could not get rid of the religious or the spiritual part of the, the human being, right? In other words, the part of the human being that uh, uh, has, has like the religious or the spiritual experience, the part of the mind uh, if you want to just talk philosophy, the a priori part that like that where values and beliefs come from, right? It's not the analytical part. It's not the stimulus response psychology. It's like this, it's this thing that everybody has in their, in their psyche that has like all the categories that they attach value and meaning to. You say, well, you can't get rid of that. So, you know, in Brave New World, they have what was called like solidarity services. And so it was just, they inverted the, the, the Christian church, and then also there was, there was Vedic inversions in there, and they sort of just mixed it all together. But really what, in, in the novel, the, instead of it being like a ceremony at some sort of a, of, a, of a religious celebration, they would have sex orgies and take drugs. But it would, it would try to mimic the same experience, right? The same that trigger that part of the brain where you would somehow derive a deeper meaning out of that. And so like, you know, when I see, uh, you know, as an example in the education system, there's, there's all this push for, I don't know if you've seen this in any of those, those programs from the UNESCO, but there's a push for what they call mindfulness now. Well, you know, that's, a, that's basically a co-optation of, right, the Hindu tradition, the Buddhist tradition of, you know, mindfulness meditation. But, but they take it out of all of that history. They take it out of the spiritual context. And it's really just like you, you, they, they have wearables for it. So you put like an app on and this thing is like going to me measure your heart rate. And, you know, it's going to give you like a, a rhythm to breathe to, and then it's going to measure whether or not your, your EEGs or your galvanic skin responses calm down. And then so, you know, uh, maybe it makes you less anxious for a little bit, but I don't think that it actually has the same healing qualities or his healing properties as like real meditation right uh in the context of the hindu tradition or, or the buddhist tradition and so it's just one example of right they they you know stealing the culture and uh you know just turning it into just another cog in this big technocratic wheel are you still there something happened i lost you Okay. So I apologize, everybody. Uh, th there was a little power outage um, over in uh, Rahul's uh, area, and so um, there was, there's 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 going to be a little hiccup here in the recording. So you know, sorry sorry about that. But we're we're back here now, and so we're going to finish up here. In particular, uh, Rahul is going to tell us about some of the specific programs he worked on, and then we'll talk about some, some solutions as well. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, and just uh, to put that in a little bit of perspective um, relating to what we've been talking about is uh, the, the sort of macroeconomics that we are seeing worldwide uh, is very likely, in my view, responsible for this uh, power outage because what we are seeing is that uh, small states and territories which don't generate as much of their own electricity as is demanded use a artificial uh, outage or an artificial reduction in demand to accumulate uh, extra allocations which are then sold on energy exchanges and then which yields uh, rapid revenue for that particular state administration. That's what I think uh, happened in the case of uh, the small state where I am in. Of course, these are uh, these are confined to best guess speculations because these are not reported into or uh, admitted to by the administrations in charge. But this really very much illustrates the sort of world that we have come into over the last 20 years of uh, where everything is commodified, including the rights of citizens to particular services. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, like you said, we, you know, you can't point to the specific program or administration that may have been responsible for that, but we know that they have those, right? And in, in Al Gore's book, the one that the book that he wrote that was the precursor to that movie, The Inconvenient Truth, in that uh, he talks about, I, I believe it was called like the Electronet or something like that, but it was this idea of uh, basically trading uh, ex surpluses. So you would be allotted a certain amount of energy, and then if you didn't use it, you could have some extra and you could sell it, and then you could trade with other uh, producers or consumers. And as you mentioned, right, the solutions to this are actually not environmental, but ultimately they're, they're economic, right? And so we know that those projects uh, are out there. So uh, so yeah, no, thank, thanks for sharing that. So did you want to jump in then on some of the specific programs that you, you worked on? Well, um, I'd like to explain a little bit about the approach that has been taken by the uh, UNESCO uh, cultural conventions. I'm just saying this as a, as a kind of background to, to the question that you asked, John. Uh, the approach that UNESCO has taken to the cultural conventions, the approach that FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, has taken to agricultural heritage, and the approach that uh, a convention like the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, has also taken to the indigenous and traditional knowledge systems relating to uh, plant and animal life in particular territories. So in all these, uh, the approaches have been um, fundamentally similar, which is that we will describe for you, we as in the multilateral system, in this case, I'm meaning mainly the UN and its partner agencies, we will describe the knowledge model so we will we will write up what it is. Uh, so we give you the theoretical framework. We say this is knowledge. We say that these are the domains under which knowledge falls. Uh, we prescribe how you, as a member state or a uh, target indigenous group, should respond to what we are asking. Uh, and then based on your response, we will allocate you space within our theoretical framework. That's broadly how it has actually been structured uh, for the last, um, I would say 25 to 30 years. Uh, it's getting more complex for everybody to deal with, including those who are, who are designing this. Uh, and those who are implementing this. And I'll just give you a, an example. For example, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization has a program uh, called the Globally Important Agricultural Heritage Systems, under which uh, they have particular headings that have to be responded to. These are food and livelihood security, agrobiodiversity, local knowledge, cultures and value systems, landscapes and seascapes. So if you want, if, if you're, a, for example, a potato farmer or a, or a member of, a, of an ancestral potato seed community up in the Andes somewhere, and you have <clears throat> been approached by a member of uh, your state government or your national government uh, to prepare responses to this, you are told that these are what you have to reply to. And so uh, the, it takes the form of a convention or a, or a multilateral treaty, except it has to do with uh, broadly with cultures and lifestyles or life ways or folk ways. And so you are nudged in many ways into providing answers which will fulfill this. In the same way for UNESCO, whether it's the well-known World Heritage Convention, which is uh, uh, more than 30 years old now, or the convention that I have to do uh, deal mainly with, which is the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. Again, there are distinct domains that are provided and you as a indigenous community or any kind of community which has a social or cultural practice, you are asked to respond to what is being asked, uh, is being um, provided by 
through this theoretical framework. So in uh, the intangible cultural heritage convention, for example, five domains are given. They said it is suggested, but in fact, they are given. And these domains are oral traditions and expressions, the performing arts, uh, social practices, rituals, and festivals, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, and uh, traditional craftsmanship. So it suggests these five, and the inference is that all the valuable cultural practices and life ways available and extant in the world today somehow fall under only these five. And uh, it's the same with FAO. Under the CBD, for example, uh, where um, it's uh, with its two protocols, especially the Nagoya protocol, you have to describe access and benefit sharing. Uh, how do you um, access a, a, a medicinal plant store that is represented by an entire forest? So you are told that this is what access and benefit sharing means, and you have to describe how you make it work in your context, uh, which the UN agencies and several other agencies which work with the UN call localization. They actually call it that. So what it in effect means is that uh, you are expected to interpret and translate this framework, put it into the context in which you and your community are living, and provide us the answers so that we can present to the rest of the world that we have recognized your existence and your participation in our program. So that distance of participation is very pronounced. You are not the creator of knowledge. You are the consumer of the theoretical framework concerning knowledge which we have invented and which we have asked you to participate in. So uh, I have to admit, uh, John, that it took, me, <laughs> it took me several years to really understand what was going on. Uh, because, you know, I got into these, uh, I have to say with, uh, I mean, looking back now in retrospectively with some amount of naivet, um, believing that, yes, there was, uh, sufficient altruism uh, in these programs, which attracted me and which I wanted to help strengthen. And that these overweighed the uh, larger geopolitical uh, stresses and strains, which are inevitable in any sort of multilateral setting. But no, of course, it wasn't true at all. Uh, this, um, uh, in fact, is a much uh, deeper manifestation, I would say, of uh, the problem of the problem that uh, was has been better described by uh, one of your other uh, preparatory questions to our um, discussion, which uh, concerns what we generally call brain drain. Uh, and you've talked about what is the effects of brain drain on loss of biodiversity, patents on indigenous, indigenous foods and medicines, supply chain and food distribution. And um, I'll just try and, and make the connections between what I've just described and your question about brain drain. Uh, so by brain drain, the, uh, 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 which is a term that we've seen being used from around the mid to late 1960s, and which describes really the process of the, um, the bright minds of the, what used to be the Southern world, the, the third world, the bright minds of the third world being taken to the first world, the industrialized societies, to be able to partake of the great smorgasbord of knowledge that exists in the first world and which apparently doesn't in the third world, in order to educate and refine and equip themselves to carry on 
the great project of civilizing the world once they either return to their home countries or act on behalf of their home countries in the first world. And that was that whole process, which I mean, I've uh, very summarily described it, but that whole process is what we call brain drain. Uh, and this uh, was very apparent in probably from the late 50s until the mid 70s or so, when uh, a large number of uh, uh, young people, probably from the ages of uh, uh, college going uh, youth till perhaps even their early academic careers, which would place them in the age band of about 30 to 35, were attracted away from their home countries and placed into, especially into universities in the West. I mean, from my perspective, the West, which would be uh, where you are in USA and uh, of course Europe as well. Uh, and so what happened is that uh, these created, um, examples of Southern intelligentsia, in fact, being in the position where they absorbed the ideals of the formerly colonial master countries. Uh, and because of the reputations and uh, the um, great visibility of these institutions that these Asians and Africans were placed into, they naturally became objects of emulation. And uh, so perhaps for a period of about 20 to 25 years, they inspired many, many others to try and do the same, many of whom in fact did to some extent. But then what happened in the, uh, from around the 2000s, I would say, uh, which is around the time that Latin America, Central America, some parts of Africa, certainly uh, uh, parts of uh, South Asia, including India and Southeast Asia, when they experienced what uh, the World Bank and IMF uh, rammed through governments as a structural adjustment, then again we see this whole phenomenon of a theoretical model being planted in the former colon the former formerly colonized countries. And uh, then the project continued, but with a somewhat different, not a somewhat different, but significantly different shift, which is that the third world intelligentsia were not, no longer needed to be transported to the first world in order to absorb the uh, civilization making uh, apparatus. Instead, they were indoctrinated in place. Uh, and we saw that because of the broader um, pushing of what we now see is, as the United Nations agenda, so the multilateral system agenda, the financial, the um, manufacturing, uh, and especially the education, so the indoctrination frameworks, began to be shifted uh, to deliver these in situ, in place, uh, and the for I think what we can call the globalists, the big advantage of doing so is that whereas uh, one and a half to two generations early in the 1960s, you were able to pluck out maybe half a dozen people from from developing India or uh, Indonesia or uh, Nigeria or um, uh, East Africa and uh, take them to Western universities and indoctrinate them. Now you are able to do the same through institutional partnerships in those countries. And instead of six, you reached 50. Uh, and you funneled money into supporting those 50 uh, who in fact were became broadcasting agents for everything that you stood for. So uh, that's what uh, I'm, um, I'm saying this on the basis of my own observation of having worked in government here and seeing the way in which our government uh, was in fact an active partner in this whole enterprise. Um, and so it, it, it became like a multi-level marketing scheme. You had the, the 
the the international uh, UN and multilateral system, and you had the exact facsimile of it, but at a regional level and at a country level. And uh, the effects, of course, uh, pertaining to, uh, as you described, patents, loss of biodiversity, etc., uh, became immediately palpable because uh, the justification for moving genetic material out of the South was provided by this group, which had been newly indoctrinated. By newly, I mean uh, over 20 years instead of over 50 years, um, <clears throat> which were then successfully able to advance the argument that, for example, cross, uh, crop seeds, you don't have the facility or the manpower or the, the research resources to deal with the long-term storage of crop seeds, which are crucial to addressing food security in your country because you are still setting up uh, your systems being a formerly third world country and therefore uh, deficient in these aspects. So we will take the responsibility of maintaining these seeds for you uh, in our super advanced, wonderful uh, seed vaults, uh, one of which is somewhere near the Arctic Circle. Uh, and uh, this will be the uh, stewarded heritage of mankind to come and so on and so forth. So very noble language, but very ignoble um, motives behind it. I, I mean, the seed, you know, the seed vault I'm referring to is the one in Svalbard. Um, which I think is a completely grotesque concept, but I mean, seeds have always been stored. I, I mean, to imagine that I, as a rice farmer in South India, don't know how to store my seeds. I mean, you must be mad. Uh, but, you know, at an institutional level, uh, this was the fiction that was very successfully peddled and consumed as well. And in the same way, the idea that cultural and social heritage were to be, you know, as I said earlier, the frameworks of definition were provided. And then that extended to the cultural and social responsibilities for, for heritage were also taken away from the communities, which in fact held that heritage and practiced it until the present day. And that responsibility was taken away and given to these conventions, these multilateral conventions and, and treaties saying that now we will manage it for you with the, uh, with the country government and its partners becoming the agents in the process. So uh, this sort of catapulted brain drain into a dimension, which I would say is you know, practically in orbit. Uh, it's, 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 it's a staggering deception if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you mentioned uh, they call it localization, right? Yeah. And, you know, they're really good with their, their what George Orwell called doublespeak on their on their rhetoric, right? Yeah. And so, you know, as you mentioned, you know, you, you thought that these people had, you know, very good intentions, altruistic, you know, they're using rhetoric like localization. So the, so the implication is that, that the, 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 the program is going to be controlled organically by the local people on the ground. Yeah. But really what's being localized is the multilateral system, right? Like, yeah. so, so, it, so there's a truth in what they're saying. It's just not what you would interpret it to be. And, you know, in the end, you know, and they also are pitching it like, well, we're here to help you preserve your own culture by localizing it. But yes. in the long run, they're doing nothing other than losing that culture by uh, wedging it into all of these predetermined categories that they have created, you know, through through the, all their different UN projects and, and, you know, their different corporate initiatives. And, and another thing that, we, that you said that uh, kind of it, it reminded me, here's a book here, uh, Tragedy and Hope, Carol Quigley. And, uh, you know, it's like basically the history of Western civilization, you know, starting like feudal period. But there's a big section in there about, you know, World War One and and, uh, and prior to World War One, the, the Rhodes Society and the, the Rhodes Universities. And, you know, when you talked about basically bringing, you know, people from their indigenous communities and then indoctrinating them in these Western systems, I mean, I think that was really one of the 
the early pilots for that system was the Rhodes Society. And he literally said, you know, we're, we're going to go across the world and educate people to basically be, at the time, good British citizens, right? To basically bring on what Quigley would later call the, uh, the Anglo-American establishment or the Anglo-American empire. And so under the guise of we're going to help, you know, like you said, civilized people and, and educate them, but really we're going to brainwash them to bring our system back there. And then everything that you just said, over a period of, you know, decades, you know, changing the programs, changing the institutions, you know, incorporating more companies, incorporating these global governance institutions. So that's, that's just something that, that popped into my, uh, into my head when you said that there. So how about some solutions then, right? So we, we, we think we've laid out the, the problems pretty good, right? And, uh, and how, how all these different parts move together on this grand chessboard. Uh, what, what would you say uh, would be ways to counteract this or to somehow get away from it or to, you know, have some alternative to the, the long-term game plan that they've gained so much ground on already? I think what we, what we are attempting uh, through this discussion is uh, really the starting point of uh, big of beginning to assemble um, a solution which would be uh, culture independent, um, secular in that sense, which could be applied and should be applied anyway, any, anywhere that uh, we see these patterns uh, having been imprinted. Because really the starting point is to be aware, to become aware of what has happened in the last uh, 40 to 60 years, depending on which unfortunate part of the globe has been identified for such imprinting. And uh, for the uh, first effort to be in, to be directed towards looking at where this imprinting has already touched people and the manner in which they organize their thoughts about themselves and their cultural heritage and their uh, the knowledge that they hold and the ways in which they choose to live their lives, uh, all of which um, it would need to be admitted at some point has been either shaped or influenced by malign influence, by malign forces in order to gain the kind of controls that uh, we've described uh, in our discussion till now. Uh, so that really takes the uh, shape of a sort of psychological reconditioning, but at a social scale. Uh, some of which I would say is possible using uh, the great store of uh, indigenous techniques uh, which are still available and which relate to identifying what is beneficial knowledge and what is foreign knowledge, which is specifically designed to supplant your own. Uh, so these are the, the, can be tackled, in fact, in many of our cultures by the process, the old processes of um, logic and refutation, which exist in many ways uh, in many of our old cultures, because that's how they dealt with the physical and the cosmological worlds around them. Uh, what is true, what is untrue, what is, uh, what is fake, what is um, desirable and so on. Uh, so we don't have to, uh, unlike our opponents, we don't have to invent frameworks, they already exist. We simply have to uh, encourage them and strengthen them, which is uh, something that uh, I have attempted to do. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I think at this point, I, I'm comfortable enough to admit it uh, in, a, in a discussion like this. What I have attempted to do as a subversive activity uh, while working on uh, the multilateral miss missions, as they call it, where uh, for several years now, for probably five years now, in whichever of these countries, the Asian countries, uh, I make sure to include in my teaching sessions uh, 
the direction or the advice that look you have in your culture ways to describe what unesco is describing for you um know that both exist employ one which is what belongs to you and fulfill the other but do not own it and from the un's point of view this is a subversive activity uh because it wants to ensure you know as we said localization and it even has another word for it in different languages which is called socialization uh so localization has to do with here's the pattern you uh implement it in your uh context your territory in your community socialization is um a little more no i would say probably more sinister because what it means is the creation of the acceptance in society that the replacement is somehow needed and desirable and um both for a successful mission in whichever of the un agencies which uh fosters the implementation of their programs at a local level that means a sub district or a province etc both must accompany each other to be successful uh very often uh these become exercises in absurdity and i'll give you an example in around 2012 um i began to conduct training for the uh, unesco intangible cultural heritage uh, work that sri lanka had begun to uh, take up and uh as uh, what we were called we were called facilitators uh, to be able to facilitate the implementation of the convention in a particular country and uh, we were asked to contribute to the um the local translations of the term itself intangible cultural heritage which is a very unwieldy term which by itself really means nothing and uh, which itself is a translation of the french original uh so for example we had a few such translations there were nothing more uh in viet in tagalog i think in bahasa uh a few others we didn't have one in sri lanka and so in sinhalese uh and so i was asked to to find ways to make this translation become uh, uh ex- ex- acceptable uh at least in the context of this training so we did that and uh, on a subsequent visit i think it was the next year i was curious about this um, phrase in sinhalese and uh, the members of the uh, so these were the officers of the ministry in, in charge at that time which was given the mandate of uh, doing this work they had meanwhile to go into some of the uh, inner districts and um, you know do the usual can conduct surveys find out who were the knowledge bearers are they still uh, practicing do they need support and so on and at the same time there was they were also to take up this new phrase which had been written in sinhalese and begin to use it and i asked them so did you use the phrase they said yes we used the phrase what happened when you used it people listen to it people listen to it but did they use it no they didn't use it why didn't they use it because it makes no sense to them <laughs> so we had this so when i said this that look you're asking for the localization of a phrase which makes no sense because you can say that we've used this and we can now say intangible culture heritage in 25 languages instead of 20 it has no meaning whatsoever because in those contexts there is no such thing as intangible as distinct from tangible uh so why are you even doing this 
Um, and uh, of course, I never got a reply. And uh, it was uh, foolish to expect that there should have been a reply. Uh, because that was a very, that would have been a very visible, um, very visible sign of localization having become successful. But so uh, this is a particularly, uh, I think, telling example of what in fact happens uh, when this a, uh, a view of your knowledge is being attacked by another view which has been imported from outside. And um, it took me, I think that was one of the contributing factors as I was telling you to rid me of my naivet about what these agencies actually stood for. Because when you start uh, attacking language, local language, and when you start attacking the concepts that are embodied in local language, that is when you are in, in fact attacking the thought processes that are endemic to that culture in that language. And uh, I found that at the outset, very offensive. And later I realized, of course, it was designed to be offensive uh, because the offense had a great deal of strategy behind it. <laughs> that was where my mind went when you said, you know, they use this term intangible cultures that's basically not capable of being translated into the indigenous language. And especially in a culture where, like you said, there's, there's no language for it because it's not conceived of that way. So it's, I, I, my mind immediately goes, so did they pick that on purpose so that by over time, by, and, and this is well-documented psychological theory in terms of how to condition, not just behavior, but values. And, and if you want to change somebody's values, I mean, you could try to persuade them, but if you just get them participating in, in, in habits that go against those values, then eventually they start to just use the language that goes with the behavior, because this is the pattern that they, that they act out every day. And so, as you mentioned, so the localization is basically, you know, use the language we want you to use, fit, fit uh, the agriculture or um, the, the medicine or the education into this, into this paradigm. But then the socialization is where after doing that, over time, it becomes the culture. It becomes the, the, that process where we're just using the words. Now we're believing the words, and 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 that process gets you away from the old the concepts and the old language. So so to use, it, I mean, I, I I immediately think like, do they do they pick this this term that they know is so far removed that by using it over a period of time, the effect will inevitably be. That, that socialization process takes them not just away from the material practices in terms of the culture, but the conception of the culture has to change as, as well. So, yes. so that's me being cynical, but it sounds like it probably is that. <laughs> no, uh, John, it's not cynical at all. That is the reality. And uh, that is the reality. And that is something that uh, I began to militate against because it went it went completely counter to the principle that there are cultures, there are cultural practices, there are observances, there are rituals, etc. All of which contributes to <clears throat> the great diversity that we call humanity, which uh, deserves to be, but certainly deserves to be better recognized and understood and appreciated. But in no way means that they should be interfered with by outside forces. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, what, like, you know, to, to actually localize, you know, if, you if they really wanted to help, it would be like, hey, we want to help out with some stuff. You know, we've got some technologies maybe that you could use. You tell us how you do it and we'll see where maybe you, we're like, oh, you know what? If you use this, this could help. And then we'll show you how to use it on your own. But it's totally inverted, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have seen that uh, that inversion and this transplanting of a an alien imprint of thought onto a local system of thought, uh, and then in fact uh, uh, the grafting is done so cleverly that eventually the foundations of the local system wither away and are not visible anymore. And this is something that 
we have seen, I think, in uh, formerly colonial countries, I mean, <laughs> I, say, I say formerly colonized countries, forgetting that you, the USA was also a colony. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have seen that, uh, uh, especially with regard to uh, land use and particularly forests, where uh, under the British, uh, uh, what we call the British Raj, which is uh, so the British Crown government, where the first uh, forest acts were um, written into being, uh, which separated the forest from its inhabitants. Uh, and so uh, this was uh, for a variety of reasons, which is uh, really too, too complex to get into for the purposes of our discussion. This was continued even in independent India. Uh, and so far as I understand, in all those parts of Asia, which I have some familiarity with, that experienced a colonial period and which have gone through independence. But the, the fundamentals of those laws pertaining to forests um, or watersheds or land use have not significantly changed in order to align them with the cultural thinking prevalent before the colonial period began. So they've continued. And this is a, I think, a most uh, dangerous form of localization that you have a legal system which has not been uh, re reformed from within in order to cast out the colonialist elements of the legislation, the statutes and the acts. Uh, why I'm saying this is because, you know, the separation of especially forest and its inhabitants uh, in the same way that there's separation of tangible and intangible, uh, which to my mind is meaningless, as meaningless as separating the forest from the inhabitants. Uh, and But what did happen happen is then in the in the um, uh, when considering this whole idea of conservation which began uh, I think in in Western society probably I don't know maybe yet after the Second World War um, and uh, certainly as a result of the great depredations of uh, the last uh, uh, 30 to 40 years of the Industrial Revolution, followed by the two world wars when uh, Europe has no old forests left. Uh, everything is replanted, everything is uh, has been managed as a landscape. And therefore arose this idea of conservation, uh, where nature was seen to exist minus human beings, uh, and with a few wild fauna permitted to inhabit those conservated areas, uh, which, you know, is, is again a form of, of macro scale design, which is totally alien to the natural order of things. Uh, and therefore, uh, conservation took a, a form in India and some of our neighboring countries in a similar way uh, which began to be achieved by removing, for example, the tribal inhabitants from the forest. Uh, you know, and our view was, look, what's wrong with you? I mean, we have a forest because he is there. Uh, if you remove him, the forest withers and becomes something unforest. Uh, but of course, again, the object was not forest because it represents a certain way of nature manifesting itself, but forest, because there is timber, which has to be commercially used, utilized and owned. And because under the forest, there is mineral, which has to be mined, uh, which we are seeing now. So uh, all these were actually, um, were in fact, um, continued again in the, in the form of uh, the transplantation of our knowledge framework. Uh, but then uh, they found expression in uh, acts and statutes and legislation. So we never, in fact, we never uh, rid ourselves of the colonial writ. 
Yeah, and that, and that, that you know, I, I guess my mind was relatively accurate when I was thinking about you know going all the way back to the Rhodes Society because you know we're we're largely talking about in this discussion you know UNESCO, which is you know after the Second World War. But what you're saying is that's actually a continuation of the colonial model, and you know a lot of people would even see it just as the continuation of the capitalist model in addition to the. The colonial uh, uh, model, you know, so, something you you said, it, and it, we I think we talked about the smart cities a little bit uh, before, yeah. and you know, it, 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 which which is a big part of all the sustainable goals, right? I mean, so part of this, this the, the the UN and the, the WEF and their sustainable you know redevelopment it largely is this you know they say this green economy, so everything electric, everything basically digital, and basically putting everybody removing every everybody from the landscape from the from nature putting them in the smart cities which by the way are you know i mean all the lithium batteries and everything i mean it's just a whole nother realm of pollution you know maybe there won't be as much carbon or something but you, know, you have a whole new problem on your hands but in the meantime as you mentioned why, why is it that, that we all they want us all in the, the smart cities other than to track and trace everything we do and micromanage the human population it's as you mentioned so that way you can rewild everything and now you have all these extra resources that you can extract and pump into the smart city thomas malthus you know was talking about the whole overpopulation thing hundreds of years ago uh and you you know you hear about it in academia and this year and part of last year i was able to travel literally all the way across the country i went to both coasts and back and I got to tell you, uh, there is way more uh, uninhabited or at least not, you know, uh, urbanly planned areas. I mean, the country is mainly, you know, like wild, you know, forests, mountains. I mean, so I'm looking like, you know, everywhere I went, there was less people than there was. So it's, you know, this idea of overpopulation, like we're all shoulder to shoulder is, is silly. You know, it's just part of, like you said, this idea of convincing you that, you know, uh, you're some kind of a blight on the natural landscape under the guise that we're going to protect it, but really we just want to separate you two so we can control you both, you know, and and uh, and extract everything for the the elites that perch on top of it. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very much uh, I think uh, what um, in line with what I have seen uh, in India as well, which you know has a gigantic population. Um, one, we've certainly crossed 1.3 billion uh, with a population that has topped uh, 1.3 billion. Uh, whereas what we've been seeing in the last, um, which of course gives you the, uh, it's 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 a very powerful number with which to support the argument that with too many people, we're too crowded and so on. Uh, whereas in contrast, what we've been seeing ever since the uh, late 1980s and especially the early 1990s, during which time began the process of uh, what we in India call liberalization, another fake word which uh, is meant to mean the complete, uh, is meant to mean something which um, in reality is uh, entirely opposite. It doesn't uh, liberalize anything, it controls. So this process of controlling uh, was heavily dependent on shepherding people away and out of the large, vast, well spread out rural areas into cities and towns. So, you know, exactly as you said, uh, remove them from the land to which they belong and where their knowledge systems belong. and shove them into cities where their knowledge systems then do not have any connection with why they are knowledge systems in the first place and turn them into wage labor serfs um, who at some point or the other through the seasonal cycle will fall into hard times and then depend on the state for the basics of uh, food shelter, accommodation, education, and so on. So that's very much what we've, we've seen. Um, I recall the one of the standout points of the results of the 
India's 2011 population census was that um, the urban population uh, was had increased during the prior 10 years at a rate outstripping the rural population and that rate of outstripping had never before been seen in India. Uh, and it's my surmise that in the next 10 years, we don't have uh, this the next, the census of 2021 has not been completed for reasons that are mysterious. Um, and my surmise is that the rate has in fact been outstripped even further. So the, the project is in fact to, uh, to carry on what I described earlier, separate the forest from its inhabitants. That was successful. And based on that success, separate the land from its inhabitants, pile everybody into the cities. And that is why uh, this year we saw, especially with the, uh, the large meetings on the uh, Biodiversity Congress, which for the first time actually spelt out uh, what they wanted. There was this uh, bizarre formula of centered around the number of 30. So what they in fact wanted, uh, what they in fact are uh, proposing is that 30% of the land surface of the world will be conservation areas, therefore devoid of people who, to whom the, these areas are their homelands, their sacred lands and so on. Uh, which is, I mean, it's a, it's a staggering derangement but this is what it's based on. You, I, I gotta ask this, because I just thought, I never, I never thought about this, but you know, when I was growing up and then you'd have the social studies textbook and they'd talk about overpopulation, they always had, right? India and China <laughs> as right, the two most populous countries. But what you just described to me, and I'm thinking about, you know, because when I read that, you know, they want you to kind of transfer that idea to just the whole world. And so you think like, you know, you're, if you're close to Chicago, like I am, you are like, oh, you know, I see lots of people and you just think it's, it's the whole world, but driving across the country, you know, I got a totally different impression. And so, uh, so I'm wondering when they use those examples in, in India and China, it, uh, is you know when they when they get pictures of you know largely populated areas is in, in your opinion or in, in your your research is that uh is that possibly more uh, like if everybody was spread out in their you know indigenous areas rather than you know corralled into these cities would it is 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 that process what's really created the 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 crowding or the overpopulation more than the fact that there's just too many people like had they not got in and started trying to pull people out of the forests and stuff would would the crowding be not a problem is, is what, what are your thoughts on that or what, what is your analysis undoubtedly undoubtedly okay. yes. <laughs> so the undoubtedly the uh the whole bogey of of accelerating population leading to overpopulation is, uh, is in fact predicated on the idea or rather the practice that you empty the land and the forest and the traditional homelands of the people who belong there and shove them into these con concrete concentration camps that we call cities. And then that justifies uh, the program more at that point, yeah, right? Yeah. So and I was like, look, look, you know, and so you're saying that it looks like the census is probably going to be even more crowded. So now they'll have even more reason to have some more population control policies, right? Or the same thing when they come in to like try to help with food distribution. But as you know, right, they're taking stuff that's local to one area and shipping it all around so that no local area has enough for itself. Everybody's dependent yeah. on these supply chains. And yes. so then they can go, at, they can talk out of two sides of their mouth and go, look, there's, you know, these places don't have that much food, but look at how we're helping bring them food when really you're taking the food out of it. And then you use this process to justify the problem you're creating and to perpetuate your, your exploitation. Yeah, no, you're spot on there, John, because uh, I think uh, this is, uh, this is a really a worldwide pattern. I have... <clears throat> Other than, other than some of the great steppe regions of Central Asia, 
which uh, I've been fortunate enough to be able to visit uh, during the last uh, six to seven years. Uh, so these are countries like uh, Mongolia and Kazakhstan. Um, I haven't I haven't visited the been able to visit the steppe regions of uh, I was going to say USSR, but uh, Russia. Uh, of course, Kazakhstan was part of the USSR in those days. Uh, but I have seen the steppes of Mongolia and Kazakhstan, and uh, I suppose like similar to what uh, what you have in the USA, which are called the Great Plains, where you know. But you may be fortunate enough to be driven to a point where you're standing and um, and you turn in a circle 360 degrees, and towards every horizon, there is not a soul, not a settlement, not a hut to be seen. Uh, and the vastness of that landscape is something that, a, especially to a city-bred mind and eye, is incomprehensible. You simply cannot, cannot absorb it in. Uh, it, it would be, I suppose, exactly the same if you were somehow magically dropped onto a uh, Polynesian canoe in the middle of the South Pacific and in every direction you see this endless vista of water. It's too difficult to visually process. Uh, and it's exactly the same with the steppe region, uh, which is land and vegetation. And the vegetation is a profusion of vegetation. Uh, there, of course, there are valleys uh, near the uh, high mountain ranges, for example, near the areas around the Tian Shan, which is in uh, northwest uh, China, Xinjiang. Um, and there, there is, you know, luxuriant uh, tree forests, but the rest of it is, is uh, dense scrub. Even if you don't see a tree, it's dense scrub, which occasionally reaches up to three feet, three and a half feet. Uh, so these are, uh, and of course, the the medicinal traditions of those regions are extraordinary. I mean, this is what the, the great practices of shamanism right from Siberia, from near the Bering Straits, all the way until the Ural Mountains covering the entire great steppes of Eurasia, until and including some of the foothills of the Pamirs, the Hindu Kush, the southern shores of the Caspian, that enormous, uh, that the largest contiguous area on earth had a profusion of medical traditions, uh, many of which, fortunately, as far as I know, continue to be practiced away from the public view, away from the view of the, admin the administrations, which want desperately to interfere with them. And, uh, so far as I've been able to, as my own tiny minuscule contribution to subverting the UN processes, I've kept them away from the, the all seeing Sauron like UN eye. <laughs> so, so when you, uh, you know, when you're teaching, you know, people in their various localities and you are encouraging them to, you know, okay, you can use this program, but like you said, don't necessarily buy into it. Don't, or you said, don't own it, right? And but so, in other words, you can you can basically achieve what they want by actually cultivating your own stuff, and then you can send off a report using their words. But in the meantime, you can act. You can do the same thing using your own language and your own values and your own concepts. When you when you uh, encourage people, especially younger people. How, how what is how is the re the reception uh, you know because you mentioned that especially over the generations that you know it's gotten to the point where they don't even have to pull people out bring them to the you know oxford or whatever they can just send a public service announcement with a unesco logo on it and, and people will kind of sign on to it in ways they would so uh in general you know are they more or less receptive have you seen anybody kind of pick up that mantle and and, uh, and and walk with it i hope so i hope they have picked it up and walked with it the the overall feeling that i get is yes uh the younger generation um let's say even those from the ages of about 15 16 till about uh, the early 30s 
uh, they are not as uh, imprintable as the UN would like to believe. Um, well, uh, in numerous, uh, numerous of these training sessions and uh, teaching sessions and policy advice sessions and, and what have you, uh, one of the, when we get into the, the discussions and the question and answer sort of uh, phase of whatever our work is, within less than five minutes, the first question is, so can FAO, UNESCO, uh, UNICEF, WHO, whatever it is, give us money to do what you're asking us to do. And the answer inevitably is no. I mean, you know, it's, it's no is said in a flowery diplomatic way, but the answer is no. I mean, I tell them no. No, they can't and no, they won't because they expect your government somehow to generate the money to do what they're asking you to do even though we know that your government doesn't have the budget to do it. And they're going to say, yes, 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 we're going to do it, but it's never going to happen. And uh, if you're expecting that a UN agency is going to fork out money to you to do what you would like to do on the basis of your cultural, your cultural practices and traditional knowledge, that is not going to happen either. Because if you're not a consumer of their package, of theoretical frameworks and its implementation, then you are not a consumer at all. You have to buy into that and you have to be locked into that in order to qualify to, uh, to, to receive any uh, euros or dollars uh, at all. And, and surprisingly, I, I mean, I'm saying surprisingly because uh, only because our uh, um, experience is that people would, will, uh, uh, bend very easily if uh, they see dollars on the horizon. But surprisingly, uh, that has not been the case uh, in general. I've, I have been encouraged by the willingness of uh, the younger generation to regard with healthy skepticism, whatever I have said and whatever others in my position have said, whichever agency uh, multilateral agency they represent. So they are not, uh, as, as, uh, as is said in American English, they are not pushovers. <laughs> they, they will not simply swallow uh, the hook, line and sinker, uh, which I hope that's still the case after the last uh, two years of uh, global dislocation. I hope that is still the case. Uh, and they have not been beaten into submission by their complicit administrations. Um, uh, but um, so far as I recall, uh, having um, had any sort of interaction at this level with uh, the younger people of, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 uh, different countries in the Asian region, <clears throat> I think those who have not been substantially touched by uh, the immense propaganda surrounding the sustainable development goals, uh, who either recognize it as something that doesn't touch them in any meaningful way or recognize it as propaganda per se. I think those are the people who uh, will provide that local leadership in those countries to, uh, to hold at bay this great multilateral monster. So that's that's uh, that is uplifting. I, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, it's kind of how I kind of went through uh, college myself. I mean, you know, it's like I think of the main things I I learned from college is kind of the same thing. Like, what are the buzzwords that they like? And then I learned, you know, their citation systems, uh, yes. and you know, and, and some of their jargon. But I mean, none of this, any of these books back here was was assigned reading, right? And so, you know, this was stuff that I always did on my own. And, you know, it's one of these things where it's like, yeah, you know, you can go to university, but, you know, uh, don't swallow it all, the client and singer, right? I mean, you know, there's, there's things you, you can get from it, but, you know, it, to be certified or to have status in whether it be the UNESCO system or, you know, the academic system is, 
is not to be to, to be educated, I guess, or to be to be knowledgeable. So was there was there anything else you wanted to add as far as like anything at all, but you know, so solutions or just other things maybe that we didn't touch on? Uh, there is one aspect which I think uh, I think we should highlight, which is uh, the you know what are which uh, I mentioned I think at uh, the start of this segment of our uh, conversation, which is about what are the acceptable domains of knowledge relating to cultural practices and life ways. Uh, there were the five that uh, UNESCO used, five that FAO used. Uh, CBD may have six. The climate change negotiations also uh, refer to indigenous knowledges and practices, um, and they have a roster of them, and uh, they are inclined also to assign them domains uh, which have nothing to do with the way that they are conceived locally at all. Um, it's I think it's significant that. <clears throat> where uh, UNESCO is concerned, uh, traditional medicine is not a domain. Uh, it was a surprise to me that, uh, why have you excluded traditional medicine? Um, and of course, uh, the experts who uh, are credited with the invention of this system of uh, classifying knowledges they either refuse to give an answer or they've gone into retirement. <laughs> so, uh, but I think uh, as we've come to expect for, as being the motives of this large system, there are, uh, there are a, there is a strategy at work. And that is that if you do not explicitly recognize any form of traditional medicine as belonging to a heritage which uh, is deserving by the international agencies of recognition and therefore protection. And that protection takes on at least a quasi legal expression. Then that, that traditional medicinal system has one less avenue of protection. And therefore it can then, it, you know, so if you say that I, for example, you look at any of the, uh, the native tribes or what Canada calls the First Nations, uh, their rights to their uh, sacred spaces and their, their original homelands is written into uh, the treaties that they have concluded with the uh, current administrations. Um, but this is insofar as their protection then extends insofar as the current administration recognizes the legitimacy of those treaties. If at the international level, we don't have a similar multilateral treaty or convention, which has specific, which has granted distinct space for a traditional medicinal uh, system, then it lacks one less avenue of protection. And I think that this is uh, part of the strategy to ensure that uh, what we have seen uh, furiously happen in the last two years is that um, industrially uh, generated allopathic medicine uh, becomes, um, has larger territories available to it to conquer. So you think that leaving that category out is so that way deliberate. It's, it's just totally, you know, it's free, it's fair game basically. It's you know it's, it's just sort of this yeah. okay. Yeah. It's to ensure one less uh possible and one less um uh, layer of protection which uh could be used uh, or should have been available to be used. Uh, it's, it's certainly deliberate. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it makes total sense because, you know, we're, we're moving into, you know, the era of precision medicine, 
right? And this is basically this idea that all medicine should be treated based on your genetics. And it comes out of the allopathic pharmaceutical industry. And so it's basically gene-based therapies. And that's what your adenoviral viral vector is for your, uh, you know, the, the Johnson & Johnson. And then, you know, you've got your synthetic mRNA. And you see all of this right now, the clamor against uh, ivermectin and the hydroxychloroquine, or just basically anything that is not, it's not a gene therapy or, or uh, you know, a synthetic mRNA therapy. The idea here is that moving into this new industry, right, we don't want anybody to have, you know, their traditional medicines and, and a large, not just, not just the practice and the culture, but like a library of knowledge that could be like, hey, we actually got something really simple for that, right? You know, it's just a root or whatever it might be. That is going to be competition, you know? And so uh, that, that, makes, that makes total sense, yeah, that they would, they would leave that out on, on purpose, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said that uh, loud and clear, John, because uh, that, I think that's important and we, we really should try and try our best to get this message out in as many forms as possible, in as many fora as possible, that um, it is the ex extant existing systems of knowledge which have survived till this date, which we have to rally around, and that the, their governance lies in our hands, not in the hands of your so-called elected representatives who are either in a state parliament or in a national parliament, and certainly not in the hands of the expert committees of the multilateral agencies who from a local point of view are completely unelected, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and therefore should have no say whatsoever in how you conduct your life and how you arrange and organize the knowledge that you have received. So I think this is something that uh, we, we can contribute to through discussions like this. Um, I think just, you know, to sum up from my point of view, the solutions that um, we can bring to defend us uh, are the same solutions that uh, societies have used for certainly the last 200 years when confronted with the products of the industrial revolution, the products of uh, the colonial eras, the products of modern industry, uh, the so-called communication revolution and so on, in order to ensure that the modes of thinking and the modes of conception of what we have and who we are and the larger world, natural world that we belong to are not subverted uh, by ever newer means, uh, which are now being invented almost on an annual basis, including what uh, you just said about these um, gene therapies, mRNA, things that to me, seem to have emerged out of some uh, heavy metal comic of the 1980s. Uh, it's uh, not to mention dystopian science fiction, which has suddenly come alive. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we have these. So we have to step back from these. These are also distractions from uh, reconnecting with our own methods of recognizing the knowledge that is inherent in our memory as individuals and our memory as a collective. And uh, keep those distractions at bay, <coughs> excuse me, and concentrate on being able to build up or rebuild or repair or renovate these structures that have brought our civilization to this point. Uh, what uh, what is being foisted upon us as a this post-industrial uh, technocentric civilization is uh, is a, an abomination. It's nothing else. Um, and the more ways we find to to call it out and 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 explain it for what it is, 
I think the more we will be able to contribute to this uh, wherever in the world, uh, people like you and me are having these discussions. Yeah, I, uh, I want to add real quick that uh, I, you know, I, I like to, to go back to something you said a little while ago, and that was a couple layers to it. Um, but part of it had to do with sort of a renaissance of not just the traditional cultures and you know, the practices in terms of you know, the medicine and the agriculture, but also the education and in that literally just consciousness basically this idea now that you know we're constantly told over here probably they probably use the same or similar phrase trust the science trust the science right and then you know like like science is this new thing and everything before it was backwards and you know archaic and superstitious and and all of that when you know science is based on as you said logic and you know you know, prior to the scientific revolution, you know, during the colonial era, you know, the West would have said something like Aristotle invented logic, right? Like, but like you said, every, every, every person, every culture has a concept that there is something called truth. And it's, it's not all this rabid empirical system where, you know, everything has to be measured and quantified and only the scientific priests can tell you how to do that. Right, is like you said, an abomination. Everybody actually has an intuitive understanding of the natural world, culturally and historically. And it's and it's through, like you mentioned, the language that we've cultivated through, you know, through our ancestors and, and through the lives that we've lived, where we can actually access that truth and that that intuition can be manifest in reality instead of constantly having to question yourself and doubt yourself and genuflect or adopt some other foreign system. So I like what you said about that, right? That, that you know, uh, whatever whatever it is that they that the multilateral system is offering, you already have a version of that, right? And, you know, and, and, and it's not to say that, you know, we can't exchange cultural ideas and things like that, but don't throw out the stuff you already have that works to, to supplant it with something else, right? And, um, you know, and, and right now, you know, this, this, this exchange of words, language, ideas, hopefully, right, other people hear this and they have other dialogues. And, you know, this really is, as you mentioned at this point, it's more a psychological war than it is, you know, this boots on the ground, occupied, you know, old version of how to colonize. It's, it's really at this point, you know, sophisticated <laughs> propaganda you know all this you know be, be scared of the virus be scared of climate change you know be scared be, be scared of your neighbor be scared of you know the the other and you know be angry at these people that don't think like you or that don't want to be part of the global system uh and so if we can if we can practice our cultures you know use our language share our values with each other treat each other like human beings uh, I really think, you know, like Gandhi said, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. And it's as, it's as simple as that. And so I, I really do believe that it's a non, it's a nonviolent thing. It's just about speaking this truth and then, and then cultivating that spirit among, uh, among everybody, you know. So, so maybe the one positive thing about this will be that this will be the one onslaught that regular people in their own countries came together to all simultaneously stop their own elites who are in collaboration together, you know, and historically it was like this country versus that country or this block of countries versus that. And, you know, right now we're all in the same boat and it's really our, it's our own elites that are, you know, playing this psychological war game on us. And so the answer then is, you know, ideas, ideas, so. That's a long-winded way to, to end our conversation, but it's been a pleasure, Rahul. Is there any, any um, can I put a link in the description if people want to reach out to you, or is there any projects or any anything that you, you'd want to, to share with people where they can learn more about some of the stuff you've talked about, or maybe, you know, maybe if they want to talk to you and uh, maybe share some stuff with you, ask questions or, or anything uh, anything like that? Yes, uh, thank you, John. I've um, I've enjoyed this uh, discussion really, and I think we've uh, we've been able to touch substantially on some of these concerns. As you say, these are shared concerns by so many people in the world against not against, as you said, uh, country versus country or race versus race or class versus class, but uh, ordinary people versus uh, some very evil folk out there. Uh, 
and uh, I think I'm happy that uh, you've um, given me this opportunity to chat about it at this link, which is uh, <laughs> quite unusual. <laughs> I hope we made. Uh, I think we've made some substantial points where, which uh, can inspire probably others and and uh, um, to to follow suit. Uh, about links, well, yes, uh, I suppose I could uh, um, send you by old-fashioned email some uh, links to earlier articles or interviews uh, with me, which perhaps explain some of these uh, concepts a bit better uh, or a few details at, at greater length. So should I send them to you on email? What should, what should yeah, I do? Yes, yeah, just go ahead and send them through email and I'll, I'll, um, okay. I'll, I'll put them in there and that would be really great. Yeah, and then, the, and then okay. you can see all that. And um, if you want, you can, you can put your contact info in there too, if, you know, in that way, you know, other people, maybe, uh, maybe other people want to interview you or something else like that. And so, right. so yeah, right. it, it's been a pleasure and, uh, you know, keep in touch and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch right. and, uh, okay. you know, uh, maybe we'll do another one of these sometime or other, otherwise, if we don't, you know, still keep it, keep in touch and uh, we'll email and maybe we'll, we'll give each other a phone call every once in a while. Sure. sure. Sounds, sounds great. I really appreciate it. Good. Well, thank you very much, John, for having me. Namaste. Namaste. And uh, uh, it's been really wonderful to, to explore these issues with you. I do hope we get an opportunity to do it again uh, with a, more encouraging report to share for the rest of the world. Yeah, hopefully that'll be the next one. It's been, been an honor and a pleasure, my friend. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles, and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms. And you can sign up for my email list too, where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, become a research member for just $5 a month, and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of U.S. Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. The database will be updated with weekly document dumps and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.